I'll call the meeting to order. Um, the vision of the village of Elmont is striving for a vibrant and balanced community. And it's our mission to grow amazing mustaches and, and uh, find a cure, you know, our, well, maybe that falls into this. Our mission is to serve the community and embrace opportunity. So the first work on the agenda tonight is to adopt the agenda. And I don't think, Councillor, we don't have any uh, amendments or anything you guys wanted to put on. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So can I have a motion to Councillor Salt, Councillor Bullock, all in favor? All right. Um, October 22nd minutes. Council, uh, Councillor Salt? Just one uh, correction on resolution 396-13. Um, we're missing a digit in, in the date. It should have 1991. We only have nine, 199. Perfect. Otherwise, any, any other right, amendments? Great. Okay. So with that change, um, Councillor Latimer, all in favor? Great. Okay. Um, now, it's very exciting. We have a delegation here tonight. Uh, uh, Michael, uh, uh, from Emergency Management BC. I invite you to come and take the stage and introduce yourself to Council and... Well, thank you very much. My name is Michael Higgins. I'm with Emergency Management BC uh, out of the Prince George office. I'm a regional manager uh, responsible for emergency response and programs within the Northeast region of EMBC, of Emergency Management BC. Thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak with you uh, this evening. And uh, as it's nice to see familiar faces around the table, especially people that have taken some of the training that we've had in the community here uh, recently in the last uh, few months. What I've got for you this evening is just a brief overview uh, provided to elected officials of emergency management in British Columbia and how that uh, primarily relates to your roles and uh, support of your emergency programs locally. Hopefully everyone is able to see the uh, projector here. And I think we have a slight technical error. I'll go over to the computer and see if we can get this resolved. There we go. Once again, in emergency management, it's all about uh, planning and trying again when it doesn't work the first time. In, uh, in the province of British Columbia, we're very fortunate. It's a, a lovely place to live. We have lots of natural beauty, as, is, uh, as you see every day here in the Robson Valley. However, uh, a lot of that beauty that we see uh, provides us with the opportunity to uh, become very familiar with a lot of the hazards that Mother Nature can pro provide to us, as well as some of the technological hazards that do exist within, uh, within the province. These slides are a, a pretty good indication of some of the things that uh, Emergency Management BC and communities just like yours have dealt with over the last few years. Uh, one in particular at the top corner on the right hand side was done up in, was taken up in Stewart. That is a, a very intense snowfall uh, that required equipment from the airport to open up roadways within the community. We're all fairly familiar with wildfires and flooding uh, and hazardous materials incidents, all of which happen on a somewhat regular basis within the province of BC somewhere. Site response. One of the, uh, the premises of emergency management is trying to deal with circumstances at the lowest possible denominator, so as close to site as possible. In this slide here, it depicts a site response where you have people, your first responders, primarily in most communities, that would be your fire, ambulance, uh, police services, that deal with, I would say, 99% of the issues within BC on a regular basis without any external support. Amongst those uh, stakeholders, they're able to bring resources to bear to deal with almost the majority of responses within, within BC. I like to say that we're, uh, emergency management is the organization that 911 calls when they need support. Once again, it's, it's all based at the site level. So you have that in immediate incident response, you have that site support level, which would be the emergency operations center of the local government or a ministry within government. And then you have the provincial regional coordination level. That's primarily where I'm based out of, is uh, we have a provincial regional emergency operations center in, in Prince George. 
And that's where we are supporting those other site support levels, whether it be an emergency operations center or a ministry operations center. And then in Victoria, we have the provincial coordination center. They coordinate the activities of the six regional centers throughout the province and provide support and policy direction when required. Again, these types of incidents happen all the time within BC. They're either search and rescues, they could be large scale flooding events, wildland fires, or one of my particular uh, favorites, uh, ice jams. River ice jams uh, seem to be more current uh, are more popular um, hazard in my books. They, uh, they offer us a, a different opportunity to learn. Uh, the picture in the presentation here was uh, taken in Prince George during their, their ice jam, where they were activated for quite a long time dealing with the consequences related to that event. It was very uh, challenging event uh, for local government because it was uh, not something that was under the control of anyone in particular. It was weather related, uh, so it it manifested itself in a slightly different way than if it was a technological hazard. Unfortunately, Mother Nature will not allow us to bargain with her, uh, so we basically work on her timelines and try to mitigate the consequences of an event. Now we're going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about provincial coordination. Uh, this is where we fit in. The Regional Operations Centre, this picture here is a, uh, taken of Surrey, uh, our operations centre down there, but they're all very similar. We have uh, six of them throughout the <coughs> province that uh, provide support to local government and to provincial ministries. We also have a, a unique relationship with First Nations uh, within BC through Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada. There's a, a memorandum or letter of understanding that uh, Emergency Management BC will provide response and recovery support to First Nations communities within BC. The letter of understanding is, uh, has been was penned quite a while ago, um, but it still holds true. The intent behind uh, providing those services to First Nations within uh, British Columbia still is the primary consideration. It basically speaks to some of the words you've probably heard before around imminent action, the preservation of life and property, and being able to provide and coordinate support, very similar to what we provide and uh, offer to local authorities within BC. Now we're going to sp I'm going to speak a little bit more around where you fit in as elected officials. This is the part of emergency management where you get to make the most difference. <coughs> This is when the people in your community are looking towards you for the leadership that they expect during emergency events. And this is how you can contribute. Emergency management and the role of elected officials in BC is to be the leader, to stand out amongst the rest when bad things happen to good people. Responsibilities. It's one of, my, one of my, my favorite photos. It's of one of my dog teams in the winter. And within that dog team, there's different responsibilities that are assigned to different players. The leaders lead the team. There's no reins attached to a dog team. So it's up to the leaders to make those decisions. They're somewhat the policy group in my world. Then the point dogs, they set the tone, they set the direction, they set the direction of travel, and they turn hard on corners. That's your senior staff. Then you have your point or wheel dogs and your team dogs. That's primarily your community. They're coming along with you. They're trusting in you that you're going to make the right policy decisions that are going to benefit them in the long run. Immediate action needed to save lives and protect property. Those are our primary focuses. The term imminent threat always comes up during incidents. What is imminent threat? Imminent threat are the immediate actions that are required to, per, to save lives and protect property. Once again, as elected officials, this is where you get to provide that policy direction and publicly support the emergency program. The advocacy that you and your offices bring to this 
is incredible. The community will follow, they will take steps to prepare, and they will join the team. As long as it's advocated for by senior government in that community. Advocacy. Sometimes working with your provincial counterparts is the most effective way to make change. There are numerous mechanisms at your disposal to influence that change, whether it's before an event, during an event, or after an event. That advocacy that you provide is sometimes critical to your community's success at recovering or responding to an event. During response, be seen and listen. You're probably in the best position to translate the emotions, desires of the community back to the Emergency Operations Center and your senior staff. You are elected by the people. They will talk to you. They will give you their take on the situation. It is imperative that that information, good, bad, or ugly, gets back to the Emergency Operations Center so that changes can be made, areas of opportunity can be capitalized on. There's almost nothing sadder than during an event to find out afterwards that there was something that could have been done. There's something more that could have been done. There was a misunderstanding in the way something was communicated to residents that could have been done differently and alleviated stress. You can also act as the media spokesperson and provide leadership and policy direction. Leadership and policy direction are two key components of keeping a community's welfare high during an event. People need to know that somebody's looking out for them. You'll also have the, uh, the task of declaring local state of emergency when that is required. One thing that's different around the local state of emergency between um, the way we look at it in Canada and, and in BC in particular, as compared with what you see on most uh, news broadcasts, here there is no tie between the declaration of local state of emergency and funding or eligible reimbursement under task when an event occurs. There is absolutely no tie. When you declare a local state of emergency, you're basically looking to take certain powers, there are a list of nine powers, that give you the ability to act quicker in some instances than you would normally have. That's the only difference between declaring a local state of emergency and not. It has nothing to do with eligible reimbursements that you might receive from the province. And you also approve evacuation and alerts and orders. That is one of the key issues I think that elected officials are able to provide. People will in, their, in your communities will listen to you. So when there's a need for an evacuation alert or an evacuation order, it's imperative that they hear from you also as to why. Sometimes that setting of the context as to why people are needing to be aware, alert, or evacuate, or shelter in place, comes from what they hear from the elected officials. Now we're getting into my favorite part of the presentation. This is where you can actually inspire action within the community. This picture in particular was taken in Vanderhoof a few years ago. They were under intense flooding circumstances, long term. They were having uh, high water for a very long time. The, the plastic that you see in the, the photograph with the sandbags above it is actually on top of Gabion diking. So they're already about four, four and a half feet up. Then if you look to the back of the frame, you'll see people standing along that, those sandbags and gabion diking. There was an area on the far side of this photo that couldn't be accessed by heavy equipment to put in flood protection. So the community got out on a weekend and hand hauled sandbags all the way around across the makeshift berm to that one spot in order to protect a few homes. It was an incredible outpouring to watch the community band together and do that. 
you can inspire that kind of action within your community. Response, project leadership. This is a picture uh, of an elected official in Chilliwack uh, that was doing just that at a public meeting. Two thousand and ten. It was a very long year. These shots were taken uh, out on the Chilcotin, and we came the closest I would offer to evacuating one of our major cities within uh, the Caribou Regional District that year. Some very uncomfortable planning sessions were held uh, to be able to make that reality possible should it need to occur. Fortunately, it did not need to occur, but the planning that went on was incredible. Much was learned from that. Sometimes you don't have to recreate the wheel. A lot of the work that was done uh, on, I would say, three nights uh, down there, uh, I'm sure you'll benefit from as you revise and develop your plan. As I said before, your input is invaluable to the Emergency Operations Center. I would offer, though, that the Emergency Operations Center is best run by senior staff and supported by the rest of your staff with visits from the elected officials. Part of the reason I say that is because... Is your presentation quite done? <laughs> <laughs> Part of the reason I say that is it it's crucial that you have an awareness of what's going on and be able to advocate and listen to people. A lot of the work that's going on in the Emergency Operations Center is work. It's work in progress. It's work that needs policy direction when asked for, but it's not the best place to be offering support. That support is best provided to the community at the community level. And being able to go out and do that and know that you're still providing valuable and necessary input is huge. Your staff will inform you. It's their job. Hold them accountable to it. These are the things they should be providing you with. And these are the things you should be asking from them if you are not getting. Who pays? We all do. Emergency management in BC is a shared responsibility, and every time a community gets impacted, other communities share the load, both at a financial level, because the money comes from the province as eligible reimbursements, so everyone has a stake in events. If you are requested to provide support, and you provide support to another community, you will be reimbursed. If that community comes and supports you, they will be reimbursed. One of the nicest parts about emergency management within the province of BC is it's real simple that way. From a financial guidelines piece, we can provide you with assistance and support when you're doing your response claims to ensure that you get the maximum back eligible that you're expected to get back. Beyond that, I'm here for questions, and I will be back. Thank you. Okay, well, thanks so much. I, I have a couple questions. Uh, one is I gather that we're going to be doing some work together facilitating a plan. Is that? Yeah. That's great. So we'll be reviewing things and, and taking a look at what plans are in place and updating them. That's fantastic. Um, does EMBC have a role to play in terms of prevention? In which case? Um, well, let's give an example. Um, I, I mean, the way I understand your office is that when things are in crisis and life or property is at risk, that's when you guys are activated. But I, I, I wonder, I guess this probably falls under whatever jurisdiction it would fall under, say, for instance, uh, Maybe federally, it'd be the trains rolling through town in terms of, you know, they're going through really fast or we find their activities are unsafe or what they're hauling is unsafe, is that we do that. Do you guys have a voice? Do you ever speak to that when you, um, 
Do you, do you ever weigh in on in terms of at a regional level? Um, not so much. Um, we're primarily focused on the coordination aspect of it, especially with um, federally regulated industries. Um, we we do take the lead from the, the federal the federal side. What I would offer is that uh, communities should plan for consequence-based response versus hazard-triggered response. One of the things I think we, we haven't necessarily done a really good job of over the, the time of, of emergency management is explaining to people exactly what they can do. Whether it's a, a rail uh, incident or it's a hazardous materials incident on the highway, it doesn't really matter. There's only two options uh, for people to take action or for communities to plan for. There's only the option of staying in place where they are or going away. Regardless what the hazard is, there's only those two options. And uh, I've been doing some research of late and I have yet to find one hazard that isn't one, stay, two, go, or a slight combination of both. Knowing what every single hazard is that could potentially trigger those things is nice. It's good information. But actually planning for something that people can do as either a personal protective behavior or a coordinating behavior on behalf of local government in, with provincial support, there's only really those two options. Um, back to your, your initial question around mitigation, uh, we do have um, the flood mitigation program that primarily deals with, with, with flood related issues and incidents. Um, as for other types of mitigation, uh, you mentioned uh, the rail corridor uh, and otherwise, those are primarily uh, looked after by the, the federal government. And I'm not aware of any mitigation um, from an emergency management standpoint, um, other than the things you mentioned where reductions in speed and things like that would be considered mitigation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'd have to ask those carriers, those uh, organizations, what, what they have in place. Excellent. Um, one, one other piece, and I'll let, I'll let you go. We've got a lot of other stuff, I guess, to consider, but it's interesting that you're here. The, um, in your presentation, you referred to the most vulnerable. Um, and I mean, what have communities done as far as keeping track of the most vulnerable? I mean, it, in principle, as a village, we try to be fair and, and kind and, and organized. But it strikes me is that actually having a list of people who are vulnerable is strikes me as potentially, you know, some sort of breach of security or personal privacy, but also extremely useful in the time of emer emergency. Mm -hmm. what, what have communities done to sort of strike that balance? Or? Um, some communities have uh, offered people to register themselves huh. as, uh, so that they would sign up for alerts for instance. Um, at the same time, the notification process that you choose to use within your community needs to fit your community. Yeah. Uh, and those are some of the things that I'm hoping to be able to work with your staff on, some of the, the, the innovations that have come about of late as to how to notify people what to do. Um, once again, working with vulnerable populations, most of those vulnerable populations require services in some way, shape, or form working with the service providers to help decrease the vulnerability of those individuals may be key. One of the challenges that we had uh, when we were, we were planning large-scale evacuations was uh, people that are living in their home with assistance from the healthcare system. So we worked very closely with the healthcare system mm -hmm. to look at what are some systems they could put in place for early notification and potentially um, conduct evacuations of vulnerable populations during the alert phase versus the actual evacuation phase. Um, we've done very similar things with uh, the agricultural industry as well uh, to alleviate some of those stresses because we were having difficulty conducting multiple human and livestock evacuations at the same time and some advocacy on behalf of some of the local officials and uh, some policy changes came into place that have allowed for a positive change on that front 
but once again it comes back to working with the providers so we worked a lot with the cattlemen's association on that uh, working with the, the health care services branch of government uh, ministry of health and the uh, the associated health authorities is also quite helpful mm -hmm. great thanks a lot thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we should, well, let's uh, accept that presentation. Councillor Salt, Councillor Latimer, all in favor? Excellent. Uh, unfinished business, moving on to DP0413. Um, hang on, I don't, I don't know what it is we're talking about. Wrong. Aha, yes. Okay, so we had this report um, at the previous council meeting, and we came up and uh, I guess it fundamentally addressed those concerns. And so we're. Yes. Um, yeah, the ownership concerns were satisfactorily uh, understood and, and, and mitigated, I think, with, with talking with the proponent and the staff. Right on. So we're talking about uh, development variants for thir 13, which is uh, the Rocky in it on Cranberry Lake Road. So, yeah. Good. Council? I'll make the recommendation. Okay, excellent. Let's have a look. Right, I'll second. second it. That's to approve the DP0413 with the condition to match the colors as listed in the development permit. Yes, I'll yes. second that. Yep. Great. All in favor? Next one. Okay. Super. Well, that is exciting. So you guys probably didn't understand that gobbledygook, but basically somebody wants to make a beautiful building that looks just like this one, just down the road. And that is very cool. Um, so we're moving to 5.2. Other unfinished business this is the quarterly budget report. And so we've got that. We had spotted that that had some uh, just technical glitches in it. And we managed to get that onto this report for our review. And we're satisfied with it. Councillor Salt, Councillor Latimer, all in favor? Excellent. For information. Um, correspondence for action. We've got the, uh, the minutes from the Advisory Planning Commission, pages 45 to 47. The gist of it is uh, they would like to appoint Bill Crystalbrink as Commission Chair and Dan Kenkel as Vice Chair. Okay. Councillor Latimer, Councillor Salt. Uh, any comments, concerns? None, all in favor? Boom. The reading file, we've just got a piece here, one, one piece in the reading file. That's an interesting reading. Can, I, can we just back up? Because there was a second piece to the council recommendation, some, the minutes. Yeah, I'd like to ask about that too. Second piece, it says it was moved, second, and carried that the APC recommends to council that the village of Valmont continues to support street and mobile vendors. Oh, it didn't make it out of the cover report. I just. Or, or if I got the right cover report. No, well, that's correct. The reason I didn't put it on the, the, the cover report was that at the next uh, APC meeting this November, mm -hmm. uh, the final draft of the regulations that the ABC has been re reviewing with respect to street and mobile vendors will be reviewed one last time and then as part of that set of minutes that will then come forward to council but at a broader level they were just speaking okay. to it great brilliant excellent okay on to the reading file uh anybody want to talk about it or you want to move receipt <laughs> excellent Councilor Bullock Councilor Salt all in favor of receipt reading file only because I would talk about it for hours yeah no doubt <laughs> well there's a lot there it's about the Agriculture Land Commission yeah. hmm okay so moving along to administrator reports here's some really wonderful uh, uh, staff reports we've got 11 pages of documentation on 8.1 commercial parking um, let's uh, I'd like to well I want to gauge council's feeling. I, I'd like to have a motion on the floor to talk about it. Um, but I want to know that council's ready for that. Sure. Yeah, okay. Um, the recommendation is that council direct staff to encourage Three Ranges Brewery and Erica's Emporium to apply for a development variance permit, which could allow for the relaxation or waiving of parking and loading requirements. Yeah, should council approve. 
put it on the floor. Okay. Excellent. So I'll second it. I have a couple of questions um, regarding the parking facilities reserve fund. Sure. Um, do we have a desired number that we're trying to reach for this? How far ahead are we planning for this fund? And do we have a strategy for this or is this a rainy day fund to start with right now? Do you want me to take that or do you want to? I hear a It was designated in a previous, uh, in, in the OCP and uh, we don't know what the intent was when they set that up. Okay. But there's never been any funding put into that reserve fund. Okay. So we want a million. <laughs> there is none. <laughs> it, I think symbolically, there needs to be a place for the fifteen hundred dollars per parking spot. If that money is paid, yes. it, the, the intent is that it doesn't go into the general coffers and then That's gets right. spent on yes. whatever else. But that that just sits there for when parking does become an issue. Right. And it's empty or has no monies in it because we we haven't collected any of the fifteen hundred dollars. So we've not needed to to go that route. Right. But it, but it is there for if and when we did okay. collect. Does that answer your question? I, I, and I appreciate the prior proper planning of the parking uh, facilities reserve fund. I also appreciate um, business in our small community and helping people get their businesses off and running. Um, that's all I have to say. Great. Um, I, I think, I mean, I recognize, I certainly recognize the intent of the the parking f reserve fund is one that if you have a business that requires a bunch of parking you set up essentially you pay into this and and if you can't create the parking you give some money to vil the village and the village will go out and, and eventually find find a place and do, and do the parking mm -hmm. so that we're not just putting this off I guess the question that I have is I want a thriving downtown. Um, I see lots of parking. I don't see lots of businesses. Yeah. If we're going to have the downtown that I want, where the hell are you going to get all that parking? You're going to have to take out all of 3rd Avenue or 4th Avenue or something like that. So um, I've asked, I, I mean, seeing this file come onto the agenda, my concern has been one of what do those thriving communities that are chock-a-block, they have maybe in a block they've got 10 businesses. Maybe 20 businesses if you count what's above. How do they manage their parking? You know, like that's what that's ultimately what we want. And do we get there by requiring everybody to have parking and building a parking reserve fund? I don't know what the magic is in those communities. Maybe they have tremendous parking somewhere far away. So, but at the same, I don't think our central problem right now is parking, and I think previous councils recognize that too. Yes. So I, that's all I've so kind of said. I just have a question. So in the future. You know, 10 years down the road. So do we continue to um, ask businesses or suggest to businesses to apply for this development variance permit for the parking? And then at what point do we say, okay, well now we don't, now we need you to start paying for this. Uh, let, do you mind if I, I take that one? Because I, I kind of hashed this out a little bit. I, I think the premise is, um, by getting these folks to apply for a development variance permit, we we don't undercut, like say we just approve their business licenses as they stand, we'd really be undercutting ourselves. We'd be saying, we have this bylaw, but we're not enforcing it. We have these rules around parking, but we're not enforcing it. By allowing it to go through a development variance permit process, we're legitimizing that. We're saying, we're saying we suggest you make an application to us and say we're gonna, we want to try to do so without parking because at this time in the life of Valemount, it doesn't seem to be required. And if there's not a public hue and cry, it is a public. It is it is a process that we're present for, as uh, Michael Higgins was talking about. You know, people will talk to us if they think that there's not enough parking on it. But the idea is, it kind of lets us gets us out of a jam right now in a legitimate way. But it doesn't open it up to say if you get a store that has really needs some serious parking, moving in, building new in some place. We still have a regulation in place. Um, it'd be nice to be fair to everybody forever, all the time. Um, but I think this sort of, uh, for me, this sort of recognizes where we're at as a community today. Today, Your Worship, we might want to add that. Um 
a review of the zoning bylaw is due or, or coming due, yeah. and that's a, an appropriate strategic consideration for that as well. Um, excuse my lack of knowledge here, but where is Erica's Emporium going? In the uh, gathering tree. It's in there already. Yeah, it's oh. in the bag. Okay. So, um, further conversation on this, or? Okay, let's, the motion's on the floor. Uh, all in favor? Okay, all right. <laughs> Excellent. Sorry. Yeah. This is still gonna come back to council. And it is. The, yeah, the permit, yeah. so. Okay. Yeah. There'll be more yeah. time to talk about it. Yeah. Right on. Um, and I mean, as it's there in the report, uh, say for one of these businesses, um, the bill is, you know, it's not insignificant, right? Like it's, yeah. At any rate, um, for people that haven't, don't know what we're talking about, check out the uh, council agenda because there's a great report in there. And it talks about what, what the thing is and what, what people would owe if, if we, if we made this. Need the last oh, Sorry. Just um, where the Three Ranges Brewery is being um, located, there was existing parking there. Is that not going to continue to be used? Your Worship. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Three Ranges Brewery uh, is complicated in that it's got a the background is that it's got a dual parking requirement depending on the nature of the, of the business. Well, it's just a manufacturer, it only requires a couple spots, which they have in the back. But when it becomes a lounge and or patio and retail store with its additional liquor license endorsements, then it's really gonna require something in the range between six and eight parking spots. Well, you're thinking, I'm assuming you're thinking of the... Immediately in front of the building when Countrywide was in there. Yeah, that's a great question. Immediately in front. So that's where Michael Lewis with Three Ranger Brewery hopes to put the patio. Okay. And where he, with his liquor license application, his primary liquor license application, he's, he's got the patio set. Uh, there is a, a curb, like a, an, a easement. Dip, an easement there on the sidewalk to allow vehicles to drive them. The challenge is with the patio in place, that easement is, is directly beside the patio, yeah. which would make it one or the other. That would be very difficult to have both. And so parking on site in that location with the patio is really not feasible. Thank you. I mean, talk about mitigation, right? Emergency mitigation here. We're making it impossible to park at the brewery. Right? We'll just have, we'll have a free bike program. That's what we'll do. That's tricycles, three wheels, sorry. Okay, we'll move on to the next item. We've got that. Uh, good questions. Thank you for the discussion. And like what we say, we'll be revisiting this at the next, uh, likely at the next council meeting. Uh, Short-term vacation rentals. Wow, another big heady issue. There's a, also a beautiful uh, report about this. Um, uh, the staff recommendation, I'll put this on the floor, is that uh, we direct staff to address short-term vacation rentals through uh, the temporary use permit process. Um, yeah, I'll put that motion on the floor. Second. Okay. So whatever. Um, my my comment is that I think it's really nice that we uh, staff has managed to consult directly with the people who are affected by this and that they're game. And I think that's so great and progressive. And who knows where we can go? You know, when both sides are cooperating, keep their eyes open. Because as it said in the report, there hasn't been any complaints to date regarding vacation rentals. Mm -hmm. um, and that's great. Yeah. Just a question because the the letter. It's not just a letter of support, but it's also, it looks like requests. Yeah. Uh, generally, TUP is only for a two-year term, generally, isn't it? Or can it, it be? It can be one to ten years. Okay. Really. Well, we've consulted an outside planner on a recommended term for this type of thing. The range was between two to five years, maybe three. And then a brand new TUP every three years should the business want to continue. But that way, council can get a pulse on how the public's feeling with respect to the venture, and it can come back to the council table, say every three years with TUP. Are we still planning on having this go through the APC, though, as well? Council, or staff, what's, what's your? Uh, 
I think it still can go to the APC. I believe in the staff report it said uh, that I think we need to deal with this this issue now. Yeah. And the TUP yeah. allows us to do it immediately. And then when some other issues that are currently at the APC, the Advisory Planning Commission, uh, move past, then we can look at this in a little bit more detail and see if there's any... Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm getting at, is that even if, if we did go this route, that the APC would still, in the meantime, until it were to come up for a renewal of the TUP, that they they review it and give us their recommendations. Yeah, that's so good. That use, use all the tools. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. I just have a comment on, on, on the short-term rentals. I believe it's a huge asset to our community. Yeah. I mean, they support other businesses other than what the hotels do. Uh, you know, they, they go to our grocery store because they're cooking for the two or three days or however many days they're there. And I think that they spend pro probably a little bit more money locally as opposed to, um, say, in a hotel. Hmm. And we are, we are in the area of, of a lot of the these um, vacation rentals that there have been no problems and they do support us as well. Yeah. Um, you know, if they don't want to cook, they definitely walk over and have something to eat. So I highly support it. Excellent. Okay, so all in favor? Great. Uh, oh, 8.3, just a little matter, um, medical marijuana. Hello. Some good, some good, this is a very good council agenda. Um, does anybody want to take this? No, I'll, I'll do it. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna move this recommendation from staff um, that staff prepare a zoning bylaw amendment to define the zones, uh, define which zones should allow for the commercial production of medical marijuana within village boundaries, and in the interim, um, that staff withhold building permits and business licenses pertaining to the commercial production of medical marijuana as authorized by section 929 of the local government act councillor salt okay. yeah i mean we kind of dance like the, the feds say stuff and then we sort of try to figure out what that means for us that's a position that we're at today I'm waiting for Councilor Bullock to speak. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've had a lot of correspondence with Braden about this one. Um, I'm curious about the verbiage that says, it directs staff to withhold building permits and business licenses pertaining to commercial production of med medical marijuana. And that's with the regulations changing in March. And how long would you hold those licenses for? Because w what I read into this now is this is a business opportunity for somebody if we zone it correctly or put it in, in an industrial zone or a, whatever zone we put it in, this could potentially be a business opportunity. So how long will the withholding of permits and business licenses go for? It's a great question. Uh, it's actually the Local Government Act um, only allows you to, to withhold one for 60 days from date of application, the other for 90. Yeah. Uh, and that is basically to say the local government is in the midst of passing a relevant bylaw, but it says it can't be held indefinitely. And so there is there is a provincially defined okay. cap on that date. Can I provide you some clarification? Sure. You had mentioned if an interested um, entrepreneur is um, wanting to do this in an industrial zone. That is one of the challenges. We currently mm -hmm. have no industrial zone. Mm -hmm. So that might be a process that we would need to go through and that's my, why we might need that 60 days. And um, is there a time frame to get back to the federal government to say, okay, we are a community that is going to allow commercial production and it's going to be in these areas or do we, is, no, okay. Yeah. It's quite unclear. I've had a number okay. of conversations with Health Canada okay. and trying to get clarification on this and they seem to be a little bit in the dark as well. They've only issued just a handful of the new commercial yeah. production permits or licenses to date. Okay. And so I think it's a learning process for them as well. Interesting. Uh, but the goal of this permit is, is not necessarily to say no, it's just to say, let's just put the brakes on until we, we understand as a village where we're at and how we want to proceed in the, in the future. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting how this how this plays out for, for this council because I think generally we've been supportive. We've actually, um, we 
passed on, sort of assented to the, the idea that sensible, B, sensible BC, what's what's going on, that we should have a, uh, an, uh, a referendum mm -hmm. on that. And we've been really open to that conversation about legalization. Um, and yet, what I, what I find interesting in this is um, to read the complaints. Again, find this thing online, but we, we have mm -hmm. some complaints in here for people who are living next to small grow-ups now. Mm -hmm. And it's, it sounds like it's hell. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds really bad. Yeah. And um, smell is one of those things that you have such limited control over. And yet we feel these things. So I, I think at the same time, if, if we can be smart and, uh, you know, we're always talking about this economy thing. Uh, um, if we can find the right place in the village to do it, uh, we, we need to be there. So mm -hmm. I think we're I think we're I think we're playing it right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, all in favor? All right. We're just whipping through this thing, eh? Uh, there is a, a an application here for an intern um, from NDIT, and. Uh, whereas awesome, therefore be it resolved. Uh, so the resolution is this, that the Village of Valmount um, Council supports the application to host a local government management intern. And I'll move that. That was far. So that one. Yeah. I'm just wondering, um, in our quarterly budget, it said that it cost us that we had budgeted 22500 for this intern, and that was sharing with McBride for half a year. How is it going to only cost us sixteen five for mm -hmm. a whole year by ourselves? The estimate was for the full year, the full cost, together with McBride, and it was an overestimate. Um, recognize when when NDIT rolled the program out, it was very unclear what their funding was going to look like and what it was allocated towards. This year, it's much clearer, and so it's it's obvious that we won't need that amount for either this year or for the next years. Hmm. And we have room, or we'll have room in our budget. I know we haven't approved it, but That's will we have thing. room, right? We've, we've made a lot of uh, concessions and things that we've already said we're going to do next year. So I'm just kind of worried where are we going to find the money for this again without dipping into reserves and raising taxes. Raising taxes. Oh, did I just say that out loud? Can you erase that? Roll it back? <laughs> yeah, I know. Big deal. Like I support the program wholeheartedly. We've seen the amount of work that our local intern sure. has done yeah. for us. Uh, I, it's a great program. I'm just we have to watch out for. I think this just gives us an incentive to make sure that we polish our our uh, fingers and and sharpen our pencils when we're approving this budget. Sure. You know, so. Yes, because I also feel like it's a great, it's great, yeah, um, opportunity to have an extra body in the office to go through some of our very outdated. Well, it, and I mean, it's a, definitely a succession planning as well, because mm -hmm. uh, in local government, mm -hmm. uh, there's so many people that are reaching the age of retirement. So there is a high, high fear of, of not enough staff available. So this program, the intern program is fabulous in that it gets these students out working in local government while they're still finishing their education. And, and not only are they benefiting the local governments that they're working for, are benefiting as well. So, like I say, it's so I okay. I agree. If we can make sure and sharpen our pencils. <laughs> yeah. I'm for it. So. Yeah. No, I appreciate the, yeah. the reflecting on the budget piece. It's yeah. gonna re it's gonna reevaluate our priorities, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Reposition our priorities, I guess. From my perspective, the uh, you know, uh, our our current intern, Miss um, Fabris, uh, helped with the Valmont Love, mm -hmm. the Love Valmont project, and that to me. Uh, you know, it's so funny. It's kind of an intern project that we got um, by the good graces of Northern Development Initiative Trust. And it kind of seems like an extra. And yet you look at it and the work that Katie's been involved in is the core work that we want to do as a council. I mean, it's, it's in our strategic plan. This is, mm -hmm. So it kind of comes to us from heaven. And yet it's really, it's not outside of our mandate. So if we're paying 25 cents on the dollar for good, good help, oh man, I mean, Come on, the next intern's not going to be as good as Katie. Is 
you. Should but, be a mere mortal. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but you know, certainly we see the, the benefit. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with that, all in favor? Great. Uh, holiday office closure. Um, we need to approve the closure of the village office from December 23rd to January 1st, 2014. Councilor Salt. Councilor Bullock, all in favor? Okay, the FCM housing campaign. Whereas. You should probably read the whole thing. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> you know, I don't know much about these things, but what I do know is that we only debate in wordsmiths that therefore clauses. Thank you. Hey, right? <laughs> Was that like. Were you expecting me just to read all that? I've got like 14 pages of whereas clauses here. Um, I'll actually get help from a counselor if somebody wants to. Yeah, counselor Salt. So I'm just doing the therefore be it resolved. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> therefore be it resolved that council endorses the FCM housing campaign and urges the Minister of Employment and Social Development to develop a long term plan for housing that puts core investments on solid ground increases predictability, protects Canadians from the planned expiry of the 1.7 billion in social housing agreements, and ensures a healthy stock of affordable rental housing for Canadians. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution be sent to the Minister, noted above, to MLA Rich Coleman, Minister Responsible for Housing, to MP Kathy McLeod, to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, and to the BC Housing Association. Excellent. That's great. I second it. Okay. All in favor? <laughs> right on. Right on. Okay, 8.7. Um, here, this is kind of interesting, pages 77 to 89. Um, dual local government association membership. So, uh, staff is, I guess, seeking direction on whether we should request dual membership privileges to be part of the North Central Local Government Association as well as the Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Governments. And um, I'm going to, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I've been sort of a little bit at the forefront of this. I, so I will move it. And I'm not sure if we have a seconder yeah, to get it on. Certainly. Councillor Bullock. And, but I would like to have a good, good conversation around it. Mm -hmm. um, so I turn it over to Council. I'm just wondering how many other communities in BC have dual memberships. We don't have information on how many. We know there are others, but I'm not sure how many. Yeah. There are some interesting um, crossovers. For instance, um, uh, Golden is sort of an outlier that is part of AKBLG, when ordinarily, given the lines of the watershed, they're not. No, they're not a part of the other association for them it's just single membership inside the AKBLG. Um, what we're proposing is not so drastic as severing ties with the NCLGA but it just sort of keeps that open with the AKBLG. One of the things just to be completely honest about the intent here is um, for the Columbia Basin Trust the work that they do um, they're able to work really well closely with the Association of Kootenai Boundary Local Governments because it's almost synonymous with their space, with the, with those areas almost completely overlap, except for a few communities that are in AKBLG, but aren't a part of the trust. But they managed to work it out. Um, but there's some real opportunities. Um, and I'll tell you some of the things that are going on that I'm, it, it's imperative that we be involved in uh, is uh, the, the initiative for broadband. We've been included in that. But uh, the membership on committees and, and everything else is complicated quite a bit because it involves, um, yeah, it's Vailmont as outlier. So for Vailmont to be a part of that, part of that group, I think opens up new opportunities. I, and I'm, the dual membership really, we don't lose anything by being part of the NCLGA. I think there is a membership, there, there is a cost to this, um, but it's, it, it's minimal given the benefits that arise for sure. It's about $250, I think. 400. 400. 
I, I understand and, and um, totally see the connections, absolutely. I'm just just worried, you know, will you, would there be an would there be any chance that the NCLG could be offended um, by this request, and, and would they alienate Bill Mount? Um, yeah. And okay. what about Silga? Right, they're they're directly south association of us, Southern Interior Local Government Association, which goes from Clearwater down to Merritt and whatever. What if you know? How would they feel that they know we're not applying to be <laughs> dual with them? I'm just saying these are sure, things. Right? Sure. Yeah. I I just don't want Bill Mount to get alienated. Um, yeah. Because of this, but I totally understand the connection with CBT, absolutely, and, yeah. and the area that covers. So I've done a little. I've done a little bit of work on this, right. um, and and I've sort of seen to it that that it is accepted. I actually had a really great chat with Mitch Cancel um, from the NCLGA, mayor of Hundred Mile. Hundred Mile. Um, about this and he said oh you want to be a part of the AKVLG we must be doing something really wrong we're not representing your interests we're not on it and I said no we have these tourism things and he's yeah we got to do more tourism I said no no Mitch it's not that you're doing anything wrong uh, there's no other communities that are resort municipalities in the NCLGA I mean there's it's just like that's where it is the AKVLG has communities that are a lot like us Golden Revelstoke uh, even the cusp uh, for their influences in the basin right a, a community that's deeply affected by the the water levels of um, BC Hydro's machine. So, uh, and 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 I think uh, he was offended, maybe not in the way that Velmet was doing it wrong, but in in that they hadn't been doing the things that Velmet would like. Um, but uh, we managed to get get through that and just have that conversation. That no, there's some you know, there's a lot of ways a lot of ways that we're like Mackenzie, and then there's a lot of ways that we're like Golden. And certainly, it's it seems to me that this is a real advantage. Um, and the neat thing is that um, the the uh, the chair of the AKBLG, Andy Shadrach, has been very welcoming, and the current cohort that's there right now on the executive of the AKBLG is really saying, um, "Come and join us. Be be a part of it because there's so much to offer." And then, yeah, anyway, that's sort of where it comes from. Yeah, I really noticed when we went to NCLGA this year, um, when the focus was all on on mining and how to deal with um, large camps outside of of the of northern communities that not that we don't fit in there, but their needs are different than Valemount's needs at this time. Not to say that maybe one day our needs will be more in line with what's going on in the north, but I also feel it's important to look after Valemount's best interests and be able to network with other communities that have similarities to where we are today and where we are looking at, at going forward towards, um, especially with the piece of being a resort development community and with the opportunities that are, or the options that are on our doorstep right now with, with our Vermont Glacier destinations. I think that, uh, I hesitate to say not to worry about um, having anyone feel bad about us joining other memberships, but I think that we're very vocal and we're very transparent about where we are and where we'd like to go. And I think if we just continue to reiterate that to all the partnerships that we have, um, it would be really interesting to open up and and be a part of of the AKLGB, where tourism is a big and CBT is a big part of of their region. Mm -hmm. okay. I agree. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Um, the Columbia Basin Trust Community Niches Program uh, and Affected Areas Program. Um, woo! This is nice. Uh, the council uh, directs staff to solicit applications for members to join the CBT adjudication committee. Yeah, we're doing it, really. Uh, I'll move it, Councillor Salt. And uh, we, we've had a committee that served for a long time and done a great job, great group of people. Um, but it's time just to, is that fair to say? Or it's two have stepped down. Two have stepped down, two have stepped so it's time. Yeah. Let's get some applications in. So if somebody's interested in seeing the inner workings, of that particular animal. That would be a great way to do it. One second. Okay, all in favor? Can we also just note in that that we um, plan to officially release the application forms for the CIP program 
um, and the guidelines on November 28th, which is earlier than in the past, to give people more of a, more more time for the application process. Thanks, Al. Yeah. There you go. All right. Uh, moving on to the economic development officer report. Um, motion to receive, Councillor Salt, Councillor Bullock. Um, discussion on that. All right. Well, let's just receive it then. Uh, all in favor? Uh, public Works report. Um, motion to receive. I'll move receipt of Public Works report. Councillor Bullock. Uh, all in favor? And just yell if there's something to. Talk about. Uh, finally, uh, we'll, we'll get into 9798, uh, Director of Finance Progress Report. 13.1, just let me catch up here. Let's see which one it is. Okay, Councillor Salt, uh, Councillor Latimer, all in favor? Uh, the Accounts Payable Report, pages 99 to 103. Uh, Councillor Salt, Councillor Bullock, <laughs> all in favor? Okay, there you go. Uh, bylaws and policies. Uh, rezoning of 1980 Cranberry Place OCP zoning bylaw amendment application. Pages 104 to 108. And um, this is a multiple choice uh, question uh, piece. Okay, right. Okay, I'm back up to speed. I remember talking to stuff with this. <laughs> Just totally lost it. Like, what is it? What is going on? All right, no worries. Totally under control. Um, I'm going to turn it over to staff. Give us an introduction to what's happening and why it's important. <laughs> Without laughing. Certainly. Uh, the proponents of the of the application for the OCP and and zoning bylaw amendment are seeking uh, to buy the old Jehovah Witnesses Church, which is right by the Best Western on, on the corner of the highway and between the highway and, and Cranberry Lake Road, Cranberry Place Road rather. Uh, one of their conditions uh, of their sale is that the property is rezoned from, uh, I believe it's P3 right now, to R1. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that requires both an OCP and a zoning bylaw amendment because in the OCP it's zoned as a public institutional zone and, and in the zoning bylaw it's, a, it's P3. So they have to do the dual amendment process. Uh, R1 makes sense because the rest of the, the properties yeah. in that strip are R1 with the exception uh, of the Best Western, which is, which is a C4 tourist commercial. So going to either an R1 or a C4 uh, would make sense. Uh, R1 is certainly easier. Um, because of the transportation issues. Uh, currently there's no access from the highway and then to turn that property into a C4 and then have transportation access would, would be a lot, much lengthier process. Uh, to conclude, um, the rezoning and the OCP amendment uh, and changing it to an R1 will not allow for immediate occupation. Uh, that building is a church, it's not a residential home. So if the proponent was to buy the property and this was to go through, there would still be uh, additional work on the building permit side to require to get that property up to code to be a residential dwelling and then to have an occupancy permit as a, as a residential home. Thank you. That's great. Okay. So uh, from my perspective, um, it's, I mean, it, it looks like the, it, yeah, I, I'm prepared to, well, I'm prepared to ask staff to prepare the zoning and OCP bylaw amendments. It, it makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. I understand there would need to be some work, like you need windows in a house. Um, but uh, yeah, that, I can, and that's fine. That's the will of the church. So. so at this point, they're just planning to renovate the the building as it is and use it as a residential home. That's, that's my, as far as we know. That's my understanding. As far as we know. Yeah. And this process still goes through a public process when you're doing any zoning 
and OCP amendments. So. Get the feedback. We've advised the, the applicant that the earliest it would be completed is mid, mid January, January 14th council meeting. If we didn't miss a, an advertising date or a, a council meeting, mm -hmm. but but that would be assuming that everything fell into line, but that it is a, a lengthy process. Yeah. I don't know if it's appropriate, but um, you know, I as some of my friends who are Jehovah's Witnesses have moved away, and I see I, there's a dwindling in that community, and also um, our former superintendent of public works, Victor Labucane, was uh, Jehovah's Witness. So it's it's sad to see that there, there was a vibrant community, um, and some of the people were living in Belmont because that that community was here, and now that the community's not here. There there there's not a space for them. So I'll just mention that I feel like it's. <laughs> And uh, maybe we should not approve this so we can keep those people around. No. They left. <laughs> left. All right. Okay, well, let's, then let's do the right thing and, uh, and uh, ask staff to begin this process. I second that. Okay. All in favor? Great. Uh, temporary use permit um, 0313 and development variance permit 0713. Um, to allow for additional winter parking near Fifth Avenue. It's pages 109 to 120. Um, <clears throat> the background on this, I will attempt to give it, or would staff like to do it? Or With the putting in the Bigfoot Trail, um, there's less parking on street for big rigs in the wintertime, or not big rigs, but snowmobile traffic, um, trucks and trailers and such. And the idea is we have a little strip of property not too far from there um, between the uh, Vilmont Health Center and Monashi Motors that belongs to the village uh, that could be used as uh, replacement parking. Um, um, and we would get, uh, to, to take that further and get that ready for this winter, we would get staff to draft a temporary use permit and a development variance permit. For a trial period of one year. Correct. For a trial period of one year. So I'll make that recommendation. I'll yeah, second it. Okay. Just a question. Yeah. So did any of the hotels or motels along that strip lose any parking due to the Bigfoot Trail being put in? No. <laughs> From what they're required to have in our zoning bylaw for off-street parking, no, because the only parking that would have been lost would have been on our own property, Correct. which is side street parking. So in the schedule of the zoning bylaw, schedule B, where all the parking requirements are, the designated number of spots per room is per employees is there, and they have to have that regardless of what we do. It's just that with the trailers, that often filled up and then they used our land on both sides of the street. If that answers your question. The, the minimum it, number you know. in the zoning yeah. bylaw <laughs> is, is addressed um, to cars and regular sized vehicles as opposed to sledder trailers. Mm -hmm. So at, any, at some point then are, would we look at some of the businesses along there to possibly uh, purchase that lot or to uh, put money towards that lot because it's I mean, we're doing them a favor, yeah. for sure. Yeah. So, I would really like to have extra okay. parking at the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> Not that we don't have enough, but, you know, just... Uh, right. It's good for one, it's got to yeah. be good for another, so... Yeah. I see, so, so the principle of fairness, yeah. yeah. Again, this parking issue seems to be just resurfacing, and it's like, where do we stop? Right. As a village. So, just a question. Yeah, it is interesting. Okay. A good challenge. Um, for the Commons Council, so I'm going to ask for a, a vote on this thing. Um, and, it's, uh, and it sounds like we're not making it happen necessarily, but you guys will draft the temporary use permits and, to, and that'll come back. Correct. Um, so just give us an inch, Councilor Latimer. Uh, yeah, what's your salt? Because it's going to be advertised to the public, will the public be given the opportunity to raise any 
uh, support opposition they have towards this proposal to the village office or no? Yeah, it's actually just, there's two separate processes yeah. because there's temporary use permit and the development variance permit right. each have their own legislative requirements yeah. and they're both being put in place for very different reasons. Right. And so the temporary use permit will allow those directly around right. Monash and Northern Health, the hotels, the people on oh, six, yes. and the development variance permit will allow for the broader public. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So anybody can park. Doesn't have to necessarily be trucks and trailers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Correct. But who's going to park in the middle of a field? I mean, really, we're talking about we're talking about parking for sleds and trailers. I mean, idea. I, the, realistically. With the trip, I mean, before the trail was there, that strip was an unmitigated trail from beginning to end of trucks and trailers. And we, and, and by the way, incidentally, there was no safe space to walk. That it was, was dangerous. Uh, it was, yeah, it was bad. And so we said, no, you know what, we need a walkway. But <laughs> I guess the reality is maybe we're being too soft, but the thing is, is that we are displacing some of this traffic that used to come to town and so as a, as a as a measure that doesn't cost us a lot of money. In fact, I don't think it. I mean, we're able to do this in house. We're not actually spending. We're not feathering anybody's nest or anything like that. But just saying, for those people, visitors to Valmont who used to park there, then here's this other place. But I think down the road. Oh, Oops. I be quiet. It's a good opportunity to see if it'll get used. It's a good opportunity to see if we need a parking strategy in the future. We have the land, it's not being used. It's a one year trial period. I feel it's, it's in our best interest to, to see how it goes. I don't know what we really have to lose from it. We don't have anything to lose. It's just that where does it stop? That's yeah. kind of my, my thing, it's where, where does it stop? So for one year, a one year trial, you know, for the current council or the next council, it's obviously something for them to think about. Yeah. I just would like to tell us a comment that even before the Bigfoot Trail was there and they were all parking on there, it was, you know, like you said, safety because people couldn't even walk, our citizens couldn't walk along there, and even driving. Yeah. They were actually cutting into the actual line of traffic. I mean, there were, I don't know how many times that I slammed on my brakes personally because there was someone coming out of one of the hotel parking lots, couldn't see me because of all the others, and I almost hit them. Yeah. So, you know, it's also for safety reasons that we get them off Fifth Avenue. So what happened 15 years ago? I mean, I wasn't here then, but it was it like that 15 years ago as well? I mean, you weren't here, I guess. None of us would be <laughs> I know. That was a loaded question. <laughs> I see I see someone in our, in yeah. our audience that might know. Yeah, he was probably an alderman fifteen years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was always like that. Both sides like that. Yeah. And uh, you know, there was never any issues and stuff like that. Yeah. My only issue was how many of those posts are gonna get replaced? Uh, oh know, my gosh. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's yeah. why I, I'd prefer it the old way. <laughs> Then they can park there, and you still, you know, even by down by oh, the yellowhead there, you know, there's you're going to lose that parking too. Thanks, Junior. Okay. Um, and you're talking that land where the hedges, that land, is that the lot you're talking about? Yeah. So you're not going to wipe out the hedge, though, eh? No. The hedges. No, it's temporary. <laughs> We're only taking temporary measures. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Thanks. Good questions. Um, there's a yeah. We got an empty seat up here. <laughs> 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 loaded comment there. Um, the the other thing I think I'm, I'm really gonna maybe raise some hackles or eyebrows, but there is there's definitely a business opportunity in this too, in the sense that council does own the land. If somebody wanted to upgrade the property and provide security and cameras um, and make a buck on it for the village, that's a future opportunity too. And I've heard tell of that and I think that that's something that's valuable to visitors to the, to the village. And it's certainly it's part of the success of, I mean, they just say it's part of the success of the Best Western is that you look after your guests. Um, so that's, that's, that's a possibility as well in the future. I, I only as part of the plan, I, but, I, but I'm just saying it's a, it doesn't need to be revenue neutral necessarily here. Okay. 
So we, let's take a vote on it. Um, all in favor? <laughs> That's good. Step one. Hey, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, 14.3, rental of village facilities and properties, policy 12. Uh, the council approves the amendments made to policy 12, rental of vill village facilities and properties. And I'll just ask staff um, to say materially, what does that mean? There were some minor errors in the original policy. Some of the amounts didn't match up correctly. Okay. Um, this is only corrected some of those errors. Right on. And is the I, I, I think the uh, the cleaning fee for alcohol related events is going up. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love the dances, but I always have sticky feet <laughs> at them. But uh, it's good. I'd like to move this, but there there is still um, one issue that hasn't been reflected correctly. Okay. So I'll move the for Mayor and Council to approve the amendments made to policy number 12, rental of village facilities and properties. Uh, it still just isn't um, properly reflected about the change in the hall only fee on the fee schedule from 100 to 150. Ah, okay. that, that was missed again. Thanks. That's it. Okay, excellent. I'll second that. All in favor? Okay, 14.4, uh, procurement policy number 39. Uh, through separate, uh, something we do or? Okay, so yeah, we're gonna re re repeal the purchasing policy number 39, 2003. This is what's planned. And approve uh, procurement policy number 39, 2013. Okay, and so I'll start with, um, I move that we repeal purchasing policy number 39, 2003. Okay. Councillor Salt, um, any discussion? Not all in favor? Okay, and then a procurement policy number 39, I, I, I move that we approve that. Second. Councillor Salt, all in favor. I'd like to see staff have done a tremendous amount of work developing this, so thank you to them for all their work. Right on. Uh, 14.5, bereavement leave policy number 59, 2013. <clears throat> um, the recommendation from staff is that council approve the bereavement leave no, no, policy number 59. Uh, I'm going to move that. Yeah, Councillor Salt. <laughs> Sorry, I'll let you do some of these. Well, it's part of my committee race. <laughs> oh. <laughs> then it's not recorded in the minutes, but for the public, yeah, <laughs> Councillor Salt will uh, uh, move that and I'll second it. Any discussion on this one? All in favor? Okay. Great. Uh, council remuneration. Who wants this one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah no, let's go on this one now. Um, okay, so this is pages 139 to 155. I tell you, it's worth the time it takes to download this council agenda. It's very exciting. Um, that council uh, staff recommendation. Um, Why is there an either or here? I want clear direction. <laughs> I don't have to make make a call right now. I've been through this, but I'm just trying to think what we've talked about. Okay, as I understand it, right now we have an indemnity bylaw, um, which among other things says how much council gets paid. It's important for us to have an indemnity bylaw that talks about liability uh, for council. And it's important that we have a remuneration bylaw that speaks about remuneration. Um, so that is the change that I see it. What are the other substantive changes here um, in the remuneration bylaw? Is there a the, massive raise for the mayor, for example? <laughs> the remuneration bylaw addresses the um, benefits that council is currently getting, which the uh, older liability or indemnity bylaw did not. Um, talk about so the that indemnity bylaw was out of date already anyway. Okay, I see. So this reflects, what, yeah. This reflects what's going on. This reflects current reality. Yeah. Okay. 
Mr. Salt? Well, I know one way we can sharpen our pencils, I guess, for that other, oh, for that intern, <laughs> <laughs> is um, before I know the previous uh, bylaw had a built-in uh, an annual adjustment for the cost of living. Yeah. And this one does not. This one is showing that our salary effective January 1st or our remuneration would remain the same as 2013. Right. So right there, if we agree to keep paying ourselves the same and not give ourselves a an adjustment, then we at least can cough up a little bit for our intern. But that's just a food for thought until we get to the fourth and final reading. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to give myself an adjustment, but yeah, yeah, something we can think about. We still have time. Yeah. Well, I can't, I, I gotta let the cat out of the bag. I used to be a reporter, and so we would go through these things, and you'd hear people talk about the bylaws, bylaw numbers, page numbers, and you never hear the actual content of this stuff. But I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna say, it. basically, brass tacks, what it gets down to. Um, and like it or not, this is public. This is not me being a jerk. Um, Councillors get paid the, the grand sum. The exorbitant amount of seven thousand seven hundred and ninety three dollars and eighty two cents per year and this uh, was not a massive uh, move up from the previous council it pretty much reflects where the previous council was maybe with a cost of living increase the mayor on the other hand that fat cat is making seventeen thousand dollars three hundred eight seventeen thousand three hundred eighteen and fifty eight cents per per year Anyways, it's good to have those numbers out 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 in the public. There, we want you, we want you to know, and it's we're not. Uh, <laughs> every once in a while, I get into it. Somebody somebody says, "Oh, you know, you government guys, you just you, you, you take so much money and whatever." And I really do. I do fight on that point. If you want to get me going, talk to me about what I make and, and tell me I make too much. It's just going to be lineups. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, wow. Where's the money? Yeah. yeah. Considering what the, the uh, yeah, George somebody. Mayor makes, like, almost $100,000. Yeah. 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 All right. It is, it's a big city. It's a, it's a going concern. But anyways, that's what we make, and that's fine. But uh, that's what it is. Um, so the elephants, elephants, the elephants out. Worship, I, I did notate um, an adjustment for staff to make by third reading. Okay. Uh, on the now therefore clause, it's referring to sections that aren't applicable to this bylaw, just so councillors are aware. So they will be fixing that for third reading. Okay. The, the, Section the sections of the uh, community, H and 64. Um, yeah, when I read them, I went, uh, this isn't applicable. That's just one of those ones where they make something up and yeah, wonder if anybody really catches it and catches it. pasted it from another one, so. <laughs> right. Okay, fair enough. So, council are aware that that will be adjusted. Yeah, anyways, um, good show. Okay, so I'm going to move that we approve first and second reading of the council remuneration bylaw 707-2013 with the change suggested. Can we can note, note that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, can I have a seconder for that? Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Bullock? All in favor? Okay. Um, you know, I'm so glad it's not that anymore like you have to vote for your paycheck every month. That's intense. Okay, I'm kidding. In the, in dem uh, no, 14.7 indemnification bylaw 706 2013. Um, there's a recommendation here that we approve first and second reading of it. Councillor Salt, Councillor Latimer, discussion? All in favor. Excellent. So we'll move into council reports. Um, and Councillor Latimer will go first. Uh, November the 23rd and the 24th, we all attended uh, the start of the community to community workshop with the SIMP and uh, was very, I think it was a great workshop to be honest and, and uh, thank you for putting it all together, staff. Uh, a few days later, we met with Shanna Mason, who's the um, Assistant Deputy Minister to Shirley Bond, and uh, Mark Imus, and uh, that was a, a great short meeting. 
and uh, and then November 4th and 5th I attended the TODA which was the Thompson Okanagan Tourism Association AGM at Sparkling Hill Resort in Vernon uh, which had about 150 attendees and uh, I remained chair of of the finance committee and treasurer for TODA. Thank you. So and uh, did a lot of networking on behalf of Tourism Valmont and, and the village. And that's my report. Thank you. Great. Who else could ask? Okay. Uh, like Councillor Latimer, uh, the 23rd and 24th, the community community uh, meeting and workshop with the SIMP. Wonderful um, chance to finally start building those relationships and uh, getting a better understanding of of each other's uh, organizations and priorities and see where we can work together on those. Um, and I also had the Vail Mountain Area Chamber of Commerce Annual General Meeting and a new board of directors uh, have been elected. Not a lot of changes, a few shuffling of positions. Councillor Latimer is once again president and chair. Great. And um, thanks. And <laughs> <laughs> she was trying to forget it. <laughs> and um, we actually also have a new board member, um, Councillor Blanchett, representing her own personal business. Uh, so she's also on the board now too. So uh, as liaison, I'll be having to keep on top of making sure I'm reporting properly that they, I don't miss anything for them. But it was a, a good evening. We had um, uh, not too bad of a turnout, pretty good turnout. Um, it went fairly quick and short, though. And um, we just keep working on getting new membership. Uh, then on the 28th, I had a uh, public library uh, expansion, building expansion meeting. And um, we're just working on all the different supporting documentation to help um, the library building um, expansion committee to move forward with the possibility of the, the expansion, trying to get grant funding, um, making sure that it's following within the village's ICSP and uh, different requirements there as far as wildfire and um, a whole number of things that we had listed to them months ago. So that's been, we're getting the ball rolling more on that again. It's been also over the summer. Uh, and then we also had the meeting uh, with Shanna Mason, uh, as, uh, Assistant Deputy Minister. It was a good time. Great to connect with her again after UBCM. And uh, I think uh, the feedback we got from that was very positive. And uh, I've also had the Love Valmount launch, uh, which was a really good turnout. And I think um, a lot of people learned some new things about their community. They didn't realize some of the services that were out there. I know even I was able then to finally meet some people that I've never actually met that run some of those businesses. And uh, so it was a great, great night. And I think it's gonna be a wonderful project and um, I hope to be able to continue it on for future years and have more of our local businesses added in. And then I also had numerous via email uh, bylaw and policy review committee um, oh. meetings. So we, we did it via email because some of us have been pretty jammed with other meetings. So that kept me busy there. And i here tonight. I think that's it. Excellent. I've been fairly busy. Yes. <laughs> Agreed. Councilor Bullock? Okay, I'm going to go backwards. Um, today was our tourism Valmount uh, meeting. We, uh, <laughs> that's right. um, it was a really large agenda because we haven't had an opportunity to meet in the last month. Um, but it was a it was a, a good opportunity to see some of the events that we've um, helped sponsor in the last couple of years to see where we want to focus our energies and yeah, um, how we want to proceed with our funding in the future. On the 6th of uh, November, I also went to the Love Valmount uh, launch. 
And any room that you're in with the word love everywhere is, is a really good place to be. And uh, meeting new business owners in town. And um, again, it's just, it was such a fabulous project that we, we had the opportunity to be a part of. On the fourth, the community forest meeting. I'm sure everybody saw the big uh, slash piles being burnt um, around town in the last week. A great weather to do it. Um, on the 29th, I had the opportunity to go to the Coho Day um, on the Simpk First Nation Reserve at their at their hatchery on Dunn Lake, which was an adventure in itself. I was four hours late, but they didn't seem to mind. Um, got a little bit lost, um, mm -hmm. but uh, took a couple of small children and you know got to see the lifespan of the of the Coho. It was awesome. Um, they do it every year, and so I encourage um, people to take the opportunity. And I think that was what was the most interesting part about meeting the Simca on the 23rd, was recognizing that we obviously have a relationship here together, and that it would be awesome if we could advertise what they're doing in their community um, here and what we're doing in our community there. There was a, a brief discussion um, with one of the counselors that, you know, he said, well, why don't you send over your, your unemployment job board and we can post it um, with, you know, on our reserve as well. And just these little things that you never really thought about and uh, just to keep building that relationship because we know both of us realize that it's, it's vital. Um, so I was very thankful for that community to community funding. And that's all I have to report. Awesome. Great reports. Um, I'm, you guys went forward and you went backwards. I'm going to go random. Uh, <clears throat> Maureen Brownlee's book opening. Oh, uh, that was fantastic. What a work of, of love. Congratulations to Maureen. Um, it's so great because in the imaginations of, uh, Canadian literature, it's great to have a representation of this part of the world. So, anyways, it's good work. Um, and for other reasons. Uh, the You Are Building Knowledge uh, Foundation fundraiser at the Vanmont Hotel is such an awesome use of that venue. It's so wild. Um, you guys know my, uh, my band played. Um, but it was it was a great time, and I think we raised something like four grand, four thousand dollars for um, for building schools in Burma. And the great thing was, we really got to find out through an amazing slideshow that night about what the work is doing. And it was fantastic. You, you were there. What did you think? It was great. That was amazing. Um, uh, hey, great news about the Chamber of Commerce and that membership drive is is critical. You know, it's great to see you guys part of our team there. You know, keep continuing to, to make an impact. Um, <clears throat> remember, remember the uh, ceremonies I attended as uh, you know, as the as the mayor. Um, I, I actually want to get editorial on this because I, I don't have a I don't really have a, a voice there, which is good. I, I don't really deserve one, but the Remembrance Day ceremonies are always amazing. It's so great to see everybody come out, and I mean the numbers are phenomenal. It seems like half the town is actually there, and I mean for that to happen, that means the whole town thought about coming because it's a Sunday morning and it's cold, or Monday morning, and um, I just think that that that's incredible, and I think uh, it's best, and I want to say. The best part about it, there's always, a, you know, a good sermon there during the service afterwards. A good somebody speaking well to it. But r what really gets me every time is Lynn Yetter, this teacher, Lynn Lawless from the elementary school, brings in the little kids. Mm -hmm. And in spite of all of this stuff, whatever you want to say, glorification of war, nonsense. The kids there sing their peace anthem. Whatever it is, a different one every year. They sing a peace song. And to me, that's the most moving, incredible thing. And it's the main point. And I go away and I forget about everything else that I heard and just think about, wow, that's awesome. We're moving in the right direction. Go Lynn Lawless. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, the, the folks at the, uh, the Legion do, a, do an amazing job. And great to see uh, the veterans getting out. David Norwell was, was there in fine form and Les McCurdy as well. And the other folks, Al Solson. So many veterans. Uh, coming out and and uh, celebrating that aspect of their lives. Um, 
again, continuing on in random order, um, the Columbia River Treaty Local Governments Committee is having sort of what, what I hope is going to be a final consultation on what the Columbia River Treaty is going to look like. And I, I've talked about this many times before. Um, if you want to know more about it, just contact me directly and I can walk you through it because it's a long conversation that I, I, we shouldn't have here. But ultimately on November 14th in the evening at 6.30, right here, we're going to Skype with the province and we're going to talk about what the Columbia River Treaty looks like. Um, we're going to go through the recommendations of the local government committee, which is, this is new. We're re renegotiating the, the treaty for the first time in 50 years, 10 years from now. And our group of local government members have gotten together to say what's important for local governments and the people living in those local governments. And this night is kind of a ground truth thing to say, is that work that the local government's committee has done, is that fair? and accurate and realistic. And so it's, it'll be a great opportunity to see that work. And then I think as a community, I think we have to say, okay, that's the Columbia River Treaty. That's what we're saying for 10 years from now. What do we do in the interim? Because I think that's a question related to the treaty. Because I think that's a whole other ball of wax. And I think we need to be, there's some work for us to do. We can talk about that there. <clears throat> The community to community forum, uh, again, fantastic. Um, the uh, I actually managed to follow up with um, Councillor Tina Donald, who does the fisheries program in the elementary school, and she gave me a flag from when we talked about exchanging flags, and it was great to get that like right there, boom. It was just like one minute I was holding like a cold dead fish, and the next minute she would give me a flag. Um, I, I just have to say, her program being run in the Vailmont Elementary School is absolutely fa fantastic, fascinating, and the kids are fascinated, and the adults are fascinated there, and the, and the thing, and this year was really neat, they had the grade six, sevens, and then they bring in, I think, the grade twos or threes, their buddies, come in and watch, and it's just ridiculously cool, and actually, like really, they're making, like you figure this out, you figure out what happens, they're making eggs grow in a tank with two non-consenting non consenting adult fish. It's like, you tell me how that happens. It's, anyways, it is a real, it's like going out to the farm, but uh, very cool, very good. Very good, uh, very good day. And so great to see Tina Donald in action and uh, you know, keep in contact with our First Nations partners. You know? uh, the Halloween dance was such a success and I learned there um, that the reason that the Halloween dance happened with the band was that um, a member of the public uh, ponied up two grand for the for the band. Wow. So let's do a party and the, to raise money for the curling rink. And that was Arthur Newman, also known as Tippy. And I think that that was a fabulous act. So it's great to recognize that here. That and his comments were re really cogent. It's true. We need we need. We need to have a party, we need to celebrate. We've got, we're here, you know, let's do this. So I think it reflects the change in the attitude around Velma in terms of where we're going or whatever to say. Right, anyways, that gets uh, philosophical and it goes on for a long time. Holy smokes, love Velma, it was just so amazing. I was so happy to be there. I got to speak, I got like a, an hour's notice, but it was good, I managed to speak for an hour, go figure. Um, and then the other thing, I told you about the CRT LGC meeting coming up on November 14th. That was very important. There's another one longer term coming up on November 28th, which is very, very important. That's, that's our community conversation. And the community conversation was a great hit last year. I think it was uncomfortable. It was drooling. It was cruel and yet vital and useful and ultimately very kind and rewarding. And we aim to try to do that again. And I know there's not as many hot button issues just right now, but who knows, we will be in snow removal season by then and we'll have a full house. But I hope people come out because the conversations that we have, specifically around air quality and everything else, I mean, so many things, whatever bugs you about the village. And I also think, um, I know about jurisdiction and everything. Okay. I, I thought you were pointing to your watch there. No, uh, jurisdiction and everything, uh, I think, in the way that in the way that I've experienced this job, whether or not something's within our jurisdiction or not, we try to make a difference, right? We try to 
we try to advocate, in the case Michael Higgins from EMBC was saying. Um, there will be a number of partners um, coming to that night uh, in advance. They'll be at the community hall at, from four to seven in an open house format. Partners like the people who look after radon. Partners like the people who are concerned about air quality and have some resources for us to use. Partners like the Ministry of Transportation for those people who think that this crossing here is a real issue. I hear that coming up and again and again for, for parents. So they need to have a conversation with those people and they'll be there in the room. For people who are concerned about the direction of the community forest, is that are we doing the right thing or are we using our resources wisely? Community force will be in the house. So if you want to talk about any issue, I think, when I talk about space exploration, we will have an astronaut there. Just give us a little bit of notice. So that's going to be awesome. And I noticed coming into the back of the room uh, just now are two fine, fine folks, Marlene Morris and Greg Halseth from the Community Development Institute. And they will be with us tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're going to have a closed session with council. We're going to pick their brains and uh, learn from them. And, and there is a public session, which the public has been advised about. And when does that happen? They know. 9 or 10.30. <laughs> no, 7 o'clock tomorrow night. 7 p.m. tomorrow night at the... Right. Uh, here? The... I think it's here. I think it's here. Yeah. I think it's here. Okay. So many meetings. The community we... center. The community hall. The community services building. Uh, see, and I thought I saw it advertised here. I think we've moved it, Marlene, because oh. the what was happening here was moved. Okay. Okay, excellent. So show up in Valmont tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. <laughs> look, just drive around and you see all the cars. And that's where it is. Yeah, but there's going to be a lot of cars at a concert tomorrow night. Oh yeah, that's true. Which which concert? Great to have. Is it the 13th tomorrow night? Yes. Oh man. Do you guys play thing at all? <laughs> okay. They know. They knew what they're getting into. Great. Okay. So with that, I'm going to conclude my uh, mayor's report here. Uh, all in favor of receipt request. <laughs> Councilor Bullock, Councilor Salt. Uh, no new business that I see. We have a list of council all resol council's outstanding resolutions. Uh, we have a calendar of events and we move into this period that we like to call public comment period. Um, I think most people are familiar with the way that it works. We ask you to keep your comments to two, two minutes. Um, stand up and just say your name and address and speak to any of the items that are on the agenda. And pretty much everything was on the agenda, so whatever you want to talk about, it's good. <coughs> okay. <coughs> All right, so we'll move along then. You always want to encourage public comments, but you know, you don't want to... I'm going to push too hard, you might get something you don't want. Okay, so we'll just, we won't, we don't need to receive public comments, we don't get any. And then we're going to give notice to proceed in camera. Councillor Salt, Councillor Bullock, all in favor. Thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you.